Good morning. Good morning, church. Let's take a moment and let's bow our heads as I read uh, Psalm 3. Let's pray the psalm. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are, are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessings be on your people. Amen. That is the word of our God. This morning, we are in the book of Daniel as we are reaching the conclusion. We are reaching the finish line. That's what I like to call it today. We're approaching the finish line. Uh, everybody that knows me really well knows that I love prophecy, especially the prophecy that you find in the Bible, because that's God's word. He's predicting the future. He knows what's in store for us. And today we're talking about something that's yet to come. You know, the Bible from cover to cover is made up of about 25% prophecy, most of which has been fulfilled, which is so amazing. If you do a study on prophecy and understand the likelihood of it happening, and it's happened, if you're not a believer, that alone should make you a believer. Daniel and the book of Revelation both hold prophecy that's yet to be fulfilled. And today, we're going to be in a piece of prophecy that is yet to come. But this piece of prophecy is where you as Christians, and I as a Christian, we can solidify our hope and faith in Jesus. Let's hear the words from Daniel this morning, chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 4. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. When I first read this scripture, the first thoughts that come to my mind, this may sound strange right now, but when I get towards the end, it might, it'll make a little more sense. I think of the professional athlete. I think of uh, the Olympic athlete. I think, of, I think of someone who plays the cello or someone who plays the flute or the saxophone or someone who does something that is so astounding it makes you go, huh. This scripture triggers that in my mind a little bit. And as we get towards the end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring all that together for you. So in verse 1, at this time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone's, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. At that time, the time that Daniel is speaking about here is, is during the final tribulation, during this period. So you've got to fast forward into the end of the book, end of Reve in, into Revelation to understand that a little fuller. But for right now, right for this instance, we've got to keep going with the words of the text. I don't want to spend the whole morning talking about the tribulation. We'll get more pieces of that here in just a moment. But Michael, if you're familiar with Michael, 
Um, Scripture refers to him as the archangel. Scripture refers to him as the commander of the holy angels. Um, Pretty powerful angel. God's people are not going to be left alone in their hour of greatest need. The archangel Michael will be there when this time comes. I realize we've got we to gotta, we gotta be thinking of forward. We're not right, not right now. We're thinking of forward. <clears throat> and your people in this instance, this text is very important to understand that Daniel is specifically talking about when he says your people, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about the nation of Israel. Okay? In a little bit, you'll understand how it includes us. But he's referring to the Israelite people. So, Michael will be there to help. He can in no way interfere, but he can be there to help. And it was referred to earlier in Daniel when he was in Persia. And Michael was there and he assisted. And that was back in uh, chapter 10. Okay. The great prince who is in charge of your people, the Israelites. All right. And there shall be a time of trouble. Now this time of trouble, Jesus teaches us about in the Gospels. And I'm going to get to a little bit of that here in just a second. But it's trouble, the way this is worded here, and there shall be a time of trouble. A time of trouble. There's no way I can read from the Bible and talk about a time of trouble without saying, has anybody experienced the world in the last year or so? I think we can all shake our heads and we can all go yes. Here's what I caution you and challenge you. Yep, 2020 was a victorious year, whether you like it or not. The Lord shined. He blessed us abundantly. Yep, we had trials. Yep, we had tribulations. However, the glory of God still shined through. You know what? There was babies born that are healthy. There was people that graduated from schools and colleges that have been dedicating themselves to a bigger purpose or a bigger cause. All these things still happened. That stuff didn't stop. There's still great cause to have joy and rejoice. So always remember that. Even when it's a little dark and gloomy, there's still greatness because God is there. It's it's amazing when you think about the bigger picture. Don't just think about well, you know, I had to miss a couple days from work because of what went on, or I lost the big tree in the front yard. Well, so be it. You know, many of us still have our health. Many of us still have amazing things that happen in our lives. I'm in need of bifocals soon. <laughs> but that's not to blame 2020, right? It's okay. God's glory shines through all things when you keep your eyes focused on Him. All right, so let's keep moving here. And there shall be a time of trouble. So this time of trouble, Jesus, Jesus taught us about this time of trouble. And I'm going to go back to uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13. Uh, let's read a little bit here what Jesus tells us about this time of trouble. Okay, uh, let's see here. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such a tribulation has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and will never be. Jesus is talking about this particular time that Daniel is talking about. And this time is going to be of great trouble. This time is going to be something like we have never seen. We can't even comprehend how terrible this is going to be. Jesus gives an urgent message saying, don't let all of the worldly things interfere with you when this time comes. Our faith in him is what's going to carry us through this time. You know, if... if, if You see this coming, don't stop to go back and pack your bags. First of all, you're not going to need your bags. It's that important, it's that critical that you understand this. Okay, This time that's coming is so horrific that Jesus is warning against all worldly things. We have to embrace him. 
Because the next words, the next words prove this to us. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. These are the words of Jesus here. So there's hope in Jesus through all of these storms. First of all, 2020. There's hope in Jesus through all of life's trials. But even in the greatest of trials, this great tribulation, something that we can't comprehend, Jesus says, hey, put your faith in me. Believe in me. Okay? Remember this. Remember this as we go through all of this this morning. Okay? So these troubles that are so great that we can't even comprehend, Jesus is saying, with your faith in me, we will get through this because God's chosen people will get through this. <clears throat> but at that time, your people shall be delivered. Shall be delivered. Now, there is no way that this, these words are saying that you may be delivered from death. There is, these words are not saying that you may be delivered from harm's way. Because this is going to be a great time of tribulation. There's going to be a lot of bad things that are going to happen. Jesus is in no way saying that there may not be any harm come to you. But what you will be delivered from is Satan. Your deliverance will come and you will be free from Satan. As we continue to go forward that becomes more clear. It may be hard to understand but at this time of tribulation... Again, without spending a lot of time in the book of Revelation right now, this time of tribulation, there are going to be all kinds of bad stuff going on. Satan is going to tempt, and he's going to tantalize, and he's going to do everything he can to be victorious through this time before Jesus comes back again. This is his last chance. So think of, think of something negative that's happened through your life. And what if that was Satan's last chance? Boy, it would have been a whole lot worse than what it was. He would have tried a whole lot harder. Right? So, when you're delivered in this instance, some people think of that, well, I'm going to be delivered, I, nothing can hurt me. I'll have like, I'll be, I'll be in this bubble and I won't be able to bruise a knee during this time. Or I won't, uh, uh, my bank account won't be affected at this time. Or, I'm going to get that job promotion and everything's going to be hunky-dory. That's not what this is saying. You'll be delivered from Satan. We have to keep going to see the deliverance. Okay? When we put our hope and faith in Jesus in this instance, because of this deliverance, we're putting our hope and faith in His glorious return. Like, this is so important because this is leaning towards the second coming of Christ. And, and as us as Christians, we have to believe in this. Okay? Everyone whose name is written because we believe in the first coming, we believe that our name is going to be written in this book. The Christian faith, we totally believe that Jesus, not only was he ridiculed and despised and beaten and spit upon, and that he was nailed on a cross and he died for our sins, we believe that he defeated death. We believe that he forgave us and paid our ransom for our sins with every ounce of blood that he shed. And we believe that when he rose again, he was victorious and beat Satan. He defeated death. That's our hope in Jesus. He defeated death and our promises that we shall defeat death as well because of this our faith is in our risen lord and savior that he rose and he ascended into heaven and we wholeheartedly believe that he'll come back again we know he is coming tomorrow would be okay and everybody says amen we believe in his coming again and because jesus came and because jesus died on the cross and you remember that, that day when the veil was torn from top to bottom and, and access to God was granted to everyone who believes in Jesus, who puts their faith in Him. He bridged this gap. So that way, not just Israel has the chance, 
But we always have to remember Israel is God's chosen people. But God made it possible when Jesus walked the earth and died for us so we now gain access to this glorious kingdom. Jesus bridged this gap so we can now have access to the kingdom. And we can with confidence know because of this our names are written in the book. Our faith in Jesus, our confidence in Jesus and knowing he's coming back again is all we need to know that our names are written in this book. Before we were even born, it was written in this book. Put your faith in God and put your faith in Jesus to this point. Verse number two. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Well, this is, uh, this is pretty straightforward, I think. I don't, th- I don't think I can address that much better than the words that were written. Except for, this should solidify, if you ever have a doubt, I've talked to a lot of people, I've talked to a lot of people that, that say, well, how can, you, how can you know for certain, how can you know for certain that you're going to heaven? How can you know for certain that we're all not going to heaven? How can you know for certain there's even a hell? Well, it says it right here, first of all. Okay? I'm going to exaggerate that a little bit further here as we keep going. Because faith in God's word is what's the most important piece to all four of these verses this morning. Okay? Many, when, when Daniel writes many here, he's referring to all. He's not referring to just some. He's referring to all. All will rise and all will be judged. All will be judged by the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. Some, some will have everlasting life. Some, well, before I talk about the others, let's talk about the some who have everlasting life. What is everlasting life? Our time on earth, about this long. That's it. That's it. I can remember an illustration done here at church a while back. This was several, uh, four or five years ago. Uh, Pastor Randy had a rope, and he pulled this rope off, and he said, this, is our, this represents our life on earth. It was about two, three feet long, and he had a piece of tape on it. And he talked about our life on earth, and he talked about how we're to be as Christians and people, and what we're to do, and how we're to act, and how we're to behave. And then, because of all of these things, because we pledge allegiance to the king, because we give our lives to Jesus, in this short, itty-bitty piece of rope, we get the rest of it. And he started pulling this rope out. This rope was several feet long, and he kept pulling, and he kept pulling, and he kept pulling. That's eternal life. That goes on forever. That's after this short little piece. That's after this short little time here. Eternal life is us in heavenly bodies in heaven. That's eternal life. And then some, some will get everlasting contempt. Anybody wonder what that is? Hades? Hell? Think of this tribulation, this time of tribulation, caught in that for the rest of your life. The torments of hell. Worst case scenario, times 100. I can't imagine. For me, I, could, the, the, I think of this all the time. What, what could hell possibly be like? I, granted, I'm not going. I can say that with all confidence. I'm not going, but I think about it because I have brothers and sisters that I don't know. I can't, I can't say for sure. I don't know. What would be the most ultimate torment? See my wife, but can't talk to her? Uh, talk, be able to talk to my wife, but I can't touch her? I can't see my children? I can't see my grandchildren? the most excruciating pain you've ever experienced? That's what you know day after day? Think of the, the old movie Groundhog Day where it's just a continuous thing over and over again. Over and over again. 
You wake up in the morning and it's the same thing over and over again. And it happens every single day and there's nothing you can do about it. And it's the worst torment that there possibly is. Worse than 2020. Worse every failed than every failed promotion or every failed job that you ever had, any failed relationship that you had, anytime you were ridiculed or criticized at school and you were belittled or you got, felt like you were humiliated, it's worse than that. But faith in God promises something better. Faith in God promises something bigger. Okay? Verse 3. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I love it when the Bible uses the word wise. Have any of you all ever met a fool? I bet you they don't know scripture. It's amazing how those things go hand in hand. It really is. Those who are wise shall shine. Those who turn away like those who turn away, turn many like the stars forever and ever, shine brightest, the brightest. The wise, keep in the context here, during this time of tribulation, during this time of trouble, during this time of, of turmoil and dismay, there's going to be the people who are not going to seek the foolishness of everything around them, but they're going to seek God. They're going to seek the word of God. They're going to seek the truth of God. Those people, when this time comes, and this time comes to fold, and when they rise, they're going to shine bright. They're going to shine bright brighter than the rest. And then those, those who turn many to righteousness. Now, we can't do any saving. Always remember that. Only Jesus saves. But we can witness, can't we? We can deliver the gospel to everybody that we come in contact with. And it doesn't have to be grab the Bible and beat them over the head. It's not that way. But speak the truth in Jesus. I wasn't going to put this in there, but I want to now because if you haven't watched the movie Peanut Butter Falcon, you need to. Fantastic movie. But there's one part in the movie, Peanut Butter Falcon, where these two gentlemen that are on this amazing journey, because it's amazing how God works his way into Hollywood. I love it. But these two people meet a blind man, and this blind man, all he wants to do is talk about Jesus. Well, this blind man can't see whom he's talking to, can he? But this blind man knows above all things what is the most important thing that he can do today. That's talk about Jesus. That's speak the name of Jesus. And speak it to somebody that he just met. Now, when this time comes, those who turn many to righteousness, these are going to shine like the stars forever and ever. You're going to shine the brightest because you spoke the truth in God. And that is God's brightness shining through you. Do a little digging, go into Corinthians, and you can read about this. Paul spoke about this as well. <clears throat> but the wise seek the truth in God's word. That's so important when, when, you, when you look at this verse. And as we go forward in the verse 4, Well, I just love the words to and fro, and I'll explain that here in a minute. But verse 4, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So, Daniel, seal the book. Seal it. Okay? Now, sealing this book is preserving this book. It's preserving it to the end and then the truth can be read from it. Right? So preserve the book. Daniel, preserve the book. Seal it. Okay? Again, there's certain things that uh, we need to know, and there's certain things we don't need to know. And then when our time comes, we can ask that question. And we still may not need to know. That's going to be up to God. But to and fro. <laughs> My dad would say, Let's, let's put this into lay terms, to and fro. Run around like a chicken with your head cut off. That's to and fro. 
Okay? To and fro. At this time of tribulation, now remember just a little bit ago I said the wise seek the word of God. And I don't know too many fools that know any scripture. You can read some Proverbs and Solomon explained that as well. To and fro. At this time there's going to be this great tribulation. There's going to be these great trials going on. And there's going to be people whose knowledge is going to increase. There's going to be people who seek God's word. There's going to be people that seek the truth. Okay? There's going to be a lot of people that are going to come to Christ in that time. Then I, I would speculate between now and then, I would guess. Because they're going to, they're going to seek it. Okay? But then you have the foolish side of things. Do you guys know anybody that perhaps uh, they need medical attention and they seek it from, I don't know, a plumber? Yeah. You know, I work in the building field. I work at, the, at, a, work at a lumber yard, and I, I get this conversation all the time. Uh, I have this people, when people call in, they're like, well, who should I get to do this and this? The yellow pages are still printed. Today's world with Google, and I get asked, who should you call? <laughs> That's comical, I think. But there's going to be a, a huge group of people all right, now think about this for a minute. There's going to be this huge group of people. They're going to be running around. Why is the world ending as we know it? Okay, but they're going to seek the wrong person for the answer. You know, if you need to go to the dentist, you don't call your mechanic. That's not going to work, right? So to and fro... The foolish people are going to do everything they can to not seek the word of God, to not seek the truth. We all know people that have heard the truth and they've been told the truth and they, they, can't, they can't make sense of it. Right? Have, you, have you ever told somebody something, and my wife's going to be mad at me about this, but have you ever told somebody something and you think they believe you, and then a few days pass, and then somebody else tells them, and they have this amazing revelation. <laughs> okay, these things happen. But at that time, this is going to be amplified. This is going to be multiplied. There's going to be people screaming for help. And the only way you're going to get help is faith in Jesus. And they're not going to see that. They're not going to understand that. Okay? Back to the cello player. What has that got to do with today's words? What's that got to do with today's scripture? Back to the organist. Back to the uh, professional athlete. Back to the Olympic athlete. Okay? I just talked about uh, prophecy that's coming. I just talked about prophetic words that are coming. They're, gonna, they're, they're coming long after I'm dead. All right? They're coming long after most of us are dead. But there's going to be that time. And I'm going to be called upon. Right? And I'm going to be judged. And you're going to be judged. Everybody's going to be judged. The good, the bad, the indifferent, the ugly, everyone's going to be judged, period. That's the truth in God's word. Right? So your time on earth is this short piece of rope. Short piece of rope. Right? So the Olympic athlete, when they're born, God gift them with an ability. They, they're... You can, people might argue this if they want, but it's fine. Every single athlete, every single uh, person that plays an instrument, every single person that does something that puts them separate from everybody else, that's a gift from God, hands down. Okay? So this Olympic athlete is born. Michael Phelps was born with the ability to be a fish. Why, how else would he be the fastest swimmer if he wasn't born with that ability? That's a God-given ability. Okay. He gave him this ability and he gave it with consequences. All right? He gave him a gift and he could have just never swam. What would have happened? Nothing. Right? Remember that? What would have happened? Nothing. He gave him that ability and unknowing to him, I'm sure, because not every not everybody says, "Okay, well God says this is my ability, so I need to rise above and shine, okay? But God gave him this ability and he, 
He honed it, didn't he? He practiced. He spent so many hours in the water, I don't know how he doesn't look like a shriveled up prune. All right? This man did everything he could to perfect his stroke in the water. He did everything he could to be the fastest. He did everything he could so he could win the medals. He did everything he could so he could be the best. All right? Someone that plays a difficult instrument, which is basically all of them, because if you're not musically inclined, you're like me. You're, you, you just make a lot of noise. All right? But it's a joyful noise to the Lord. Amen. All right? So I can't play the cello, but I've seen people play this cello, and I've heard it, and it's so beautiful, and it's amazing, right? This is a God-given talent, and God is shining through it, and it's glorious through this amazing sound that you hear, okay? So God gives athletes and every single person that walks this planet, he gives them a purpose. He gives them a gift, right? Some people say, well, I don't know what my gifting is. Well, Everyone is gifted with the same thing, and that's to worship God, first and utmost, all right? So how many gold medals, because that's the, the highest thing in the Olympics, I shouldn't have called it a thing, but okay, how many gold medals does Michael Phelps win if he doesn't swim a stroke, but then jumps in the pool at the Olympics? Zero. Zero. How many people sit in, is it the New York Orchestra? The, the, one of the big orchestras, the, 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 the big prestigious one where everybody's playing the, the, the violins and all that kind of stuff. How many people are sitting in those chairs if they just picked up the instrument when they walked into the room? Zero. Zero. All right? So... How does this equate to Christianity? Well, let's see here. The day I declared the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the biggest part of my life, my old life was thrown aside. My old life died. When I was baptized, I was reborn again in a life with Jesus. I was reborn again in my life with Jesus. Therefore, I am the body of Christ, I am part of Christ, okay? Old life is gone, new life is here, right? My new life that has been given to me by Jesus says I must do and act and behave in a certain way, okay? Like it or not, doesn't matter, all right? Because you cannot, you cannot have a slant tongue and Jesus in your heart. You cannot have dancing eyes and Jesus in your heart, you cannot speak lies and be deceitful and have Jesus in your heart, okay? You cannot do illegal things and break laws and, and let's just let's say break every commandment that, that Jesus has given us. You can't do those things. You can't worship God on Sunday and be a, a fool the rest of the week, okay? You can't do these things, Okay? So here's the hard part. Christianity is 24-7. It's not Sunday. It's not Tuesday. It's not Thursday. All right? God commands you to do things. You should be reading the Bible every single day. You should be doing things that matter. Those are important. Okay? That is the same as Michael Phelps practicing in the pool. That's the same as someone learning to play the cello and practicing every single day. Okay? You can't get good at those things without practicing every single day. Now you can claim to be a Christian, but are you practicing every single day? Is Christianity the biggest piece of your life? So to put it all together, I'm going to give you one sentence that I want to leave you with. So you understand everything that's involved here, okay? There's a time coming in the future. God's going God's to judge us all. The king of kings is going to judge us all, okay? Now when he, he begins your judgment, are you going to be a victim of the world or are you going to be a champion for Jesus? Amen.